Good morning, New Mercy family. We're excited to worship together once again. If you're excited to worship together on the online house of the Lord, say amen. Um, turn to your neighbor if they're there. Just be like, are you ready to worship Jesus? Um, you know, uh, just like a minute before this, I had an opening prayer and I forgot to hit record on the on the button. And so I'm doing this again. But um, we're just so excited um, to worship. You know, this week, I was just reminded of the the cross of Jesus. You know, um, when 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 you get married in um, you know in our world today, uh, you get married at the altar. You make your vows. You put a ring um, on each other's finger, and it and and at that moment, it's that sign of covenant, saying that for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, I will be with you. That um, and and on the cross, um, the Son of God made a covenant, an everlasting covenant with you and me, that anyone who would believe that he said he went even beyond a marriage covenant that we know. Because in a marriage covenant, if you're unfaithful, um, you, you there's, there's reason to actually separate. But in the covenant that Jesus made with us, he died on the cross and he, and it was him communicating that even though you might be unfaithful, even though you might turn from me, I will honor my word. I will um, lay my life down for your behalf. I love you. I am with you. And so I'm just reminded, I was just reminded this week of how amazing, amazing that love is. In fact, Jesus said that um, we love because he first loved us. John said that. We love because Jesus first loved us. It's always that way around. I pray this morning, um, our love may be weak, but it moves the heart of God. Somebody say amen. You just being here, you coming together to engage, our weak love moves the heart of God. And so we just bless you. We bless you with the fullness of God's love that all the emotional needs, all of the needs that you may have may be filled as we worship him and remember who he is and remember who we are. Let me pray and let's worship together. Father, we just thank you uh, for your grace. We're just praying for fresh reminders a, of identity to be released right now. That you call us your sons and daughters. We pray every other identity, every other thing, even good things, God, to yield to the name of Jesus Christ. We just love you. We really pray, Lord, your name be glorified through our mouths, through our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. You were the word. You were the word at the beginning. One with God. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So, Jesus, you brought heaven down. 
sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. And you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus, and death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grace. Heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. And you have no rival, and you have no equal, now and forever, God, you Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, and nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Lift up a clap offering, lift up a shout of praise wherever you are. I will sing I will sing 
For you alone have rescued this life Jesus, you have set me free You alone took away all sin and disgrace When you gave your life to ransom me I am forgiven At the foot of the cross I am accepted By the power of your love My every stain Is washed away I am forgiven I stand in the light of your glory and grace For heaven's love and justice meet Now I live for the one who has called me by name Who has risen and alive in me I am forgiven at the foot of the cross. I am accepted by the power of your love. My every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. I'm forgiven. Forgiven. At the foot of the cross I am accepted By the power of your love My every stain Is washed away I am forgiven See, I'm embraced And I'm embraced At the foot the cross by the love and mercies you have lavished on us my every stain is washed away I am forgiven I am forgiven and I'm embraced at the foot of the cross by the love and mercies you have lavished on us My every stain is washed away I am forgiven I am forgiven At the foot of the cross I am accepted by the power of your love. My every stain is washed away. I am forgiven. I've had questions without answers I've known sorrow, I have known pain But there's one thing that I'll cling to You are faithful, Jesus, you're true When hope is lost, I'll call you Savior. When pain surrounds, I'll call you Healer. When silence falls, you'll be the song 
within my heart I will praise you I will praise you when the tears fall still I will sing to you I will praise you Jesus praise you through the suffering still I will sing to you darkest night of my soul You surround me and sustain me my defender forevermore When hope When hope is lost I'll call you safe when pain surrounds, I'll call you healer. When silence falls, you'll be the song within my heart. I will praise you. I will praise you. When the tears fall, still I will sing to you. I will praise you. Jesus, praise you. Through the suffering, still I will sing to you. I will praise you. tears fall still I will sing to you I will praise you Jesus praise you through the suffering still I will sing to you When the laughter fails to comfort When my heart aches, Lord, are you there? When confusion is all around me And the darkness is my closest friend When hope is lost, I'll call you Savior. When pain surrounds, I'll call you healer. When silence falls, you'll be the song within my Father, we thank you so much for your spirit that lives in us, that you are the comforter, God. Um, you see us, Lord God, and we just pray um, for your spirit to move during this time in a powerful way. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here in the silence, standing on this dry ground Trusting the promise, you're where my hope is found I'm breathing in, I'm letting go, ready for you to move the ground
ground is open, new life is breaking through. Good morning and welcome to this morning's New Mercy service. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed last week's service as much as I did. Having a joint with New Mercy Palisades was an absolute pleasure and I thought Dr. Josephine Kim's, uh, just everything she, she spoke on and how Key and John mediated through the entire thing, very informative, very challenging I think for a lot of us and uh, I couldn't have enjoyed it more. I believe questions can still be directed to all three of them if you would like. You can do so by emailing John and Key directly or there may be still some info on our mobile app or on our website, so feel free to do so. Um, a very, very warm welcome to anyone who's joining us for the first time. Uh, it has been a while since I think we've all met together and I think the community aspect of this church is what we all always did such a good job at. And very happy to get into the announcements with that first and announcement and there's actually a special video presentation to talk about our 10 year anniversary celebration and for anyone who has kids out there you know at this age things start to get crazy hey new mercy we're celebrating 10 years and going big this year by making it a two-day event Join us on October 3rd at Hope Church for Outdoor Fellowship. There will be a carnival drive through for the kids in the morning, followed by more fun and food for the adults from 12.30 to 2.30. There will even be raffle prize drawings, so come out for a chance to win. You'll also receive a 10-year swag bag that includes a communion set. You'll need it for October 4th as we continue the celebration through a live Zoom service and virtual fellowship. We hope to see you there on both days to celebrate. Happy birthday, New Mercy! That looks like a lot of fun. And if anyone has any questions about the details or the specifics, not only can you find all of the details on our mobile app and the website, you can email Pastor John or Pastor Wanje directly and they should be able to get the right answers out to you. Uh, the second announcement is for our quarantine segment. We're actually gonna be highlighting a few events that we've had in the past couple of weeks during the pandemic. OPS Cookie and PJ Sushi. <laughs> Josh, 
Kathy, what do you miss about New Mercy? I miss worshiping with my New Mercy community. Oh, I know. Uh, okay. Are you going to ask me the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What do you miss about New Mercy? I miss the ladies. <laughs> Best thing I've done during quarantine is I, after we moved, I got into plants. So I'm raising a lot of plant babies at my house now. Plant babies. Best thing I did during quarantine was get married. Sue, this is amazing ocean. What? That's an amazing. Squid. Squeeze. Squid has six legs. Are you proud of your creation? Yeah. This one's my cutest. Nice. Cutie. Grace, whose cookie set do you like the best? You're asking me? Yeah. You know what? I think everyone's is so unique. <laughs> oh yeah, good answer. <laughs> well, if you had to pick, I'd pick mine. <laughs> That looked like a lot of fun, and I'm very encouraged to see both our men's and women's ministries trying their best to push these events and in a safe way meet up and do these things. There will be more events to come throughout the year, so look out for those dates. Um, to conclude the announcement segment, I'm just going to pray for offering. So if you guys can bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray for our offering this week. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you so much for all that you do and that you give and simply we pray that we would just be better neighbors as the theme of today's intro was uh, there is so much power in loving our brothers and sisters especially within our own church community i pray that our hearts would be that of uh, giving and generosity lord knowing the uh, provisions that we have in surplus in so much surplus lord we pray that you would challenge us challenge us with the thing that we hold uh, probably the tightest of our finances of our securities in our finances and would you bless each dollar given uh, may we be excellent, excellent stewards of your provisions as we give to the community and to the church. Uh, we pray for wisdom throughout the leadership uh, to further your kingdom as you plan and as you see fit, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading from today comes from the book of Judges, chapter 6, verses 11 through 32. Please follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. Hear now the word of God. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizrites. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's earth, the one seven years old. Take down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. 
Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second pole as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, Who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, Bring out your son, he must die, because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerub Baal that day, saying, Let Baal contend with him. Amen. Good morning, New Mercy. We want to welcome the New Mercy family and anyone else joining today. My name is Lisa and I'm one of the pastors here. I hope many, if not all of you, were able to join us last week. Uh, for our first ever joint service with our sister church, New Mercy Palisades. We had a really powerful time learning about Asian American history and how it affects our cultural identity and spiritual formation. For some of you, I know it was the first time hearing this kind of information, and, and I know that Pastor John is currently teaching a course um, for New Mercy. Um, so if you want more information about that, please reach out to him. So let's pray as we begin. Jesus, open our eyes to your word today. Give us hearts to understand you and the humility to come before you and your word. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So today I want to talk about overcoming fear. And I have three quotes that will help us start thinking about this topic. First, the quote is from Nelson Mandela. It's, he says, Courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. The next quote is from Winston Churchill. He says, fear is a reaction and courage is a decision. And the last quote I want to read is a quote from someone named Ambrose Redmoon. Who's Ambrose Redmoon? Um, he was actually a former band manager of a little-known band called Quicksilver Messenger Service. At the age of 33, he was in a near-fatal car accident, and that left him a paraplegic. He was confined to a wheelchair, and he became dependent on others to care for him. At that time, he lived in California, and so he turned to writing, and most of his writing um, was about the topic of courage. He wrote until he died at the age of 63. He's really struggled to get his work published and he, his writing was only known to his small circle. But this quote is from this one article he wrote called No Peaceful Warriors. And it says, Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than one's fear. The timid presume it's a lack of fear that allows the brave to act when the timid do not, but to take action when one is not afraid is easy. To reframe when afraid is also easy. To take action regardless of fear is brave. From the passage we read today, we encounter someone named Gideon, his story actually runs three chapters in Judges 6, 7, and 8. But for the sake of time, I had Jen read part of the story. And the rest I'll just summarize and go over with us. But I really encourage you, especially if you feel like someone who has high anxiety or high fear, to read the chapters during your quiet time this week. So for some quick background, before we get to Gideon's story, 
it's a time in um, Israelite history right after Joshua enters the promised land. He dies, and the Bible says a generation grew up who didn't know the Lord or all the deeds that God had done for them. So they turn to idols, and an enemy country comes and invades them and overtakes them, and they would cry out to the Lord, and he would raise up an individual to fight and save Israel. These individuals were called judges. Gideon is actually the fifth judge. Another judge, just for reference, that you might be familiar with is Samson. Yeah, that guy with really long hair. Every time he's cut his hair, he would he would lose his strength, right? You remember him? But anyway, starting in Judges chapter 6, we learn that Israel yet again is doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. So for seven years, God allows the Midianites to come and oppress them. These Midianites would come and take all their food and their crops and animals. And verse 4 says, they did not spare a living thing for uh, so the Israelites would start preparing shelters in the mountains and caves in order to survive. So Judges chapter 6, verse 6 says, Midian so impoverished, impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. But remember, they had been doing this for seven years. The Israelites were literally at the end of their rope. They were starving. And they were afraid. And finally, after seven years, they go to the Lord and cry out to him. And God sends a prophet. And the prophet tells the Israelites, this is from the Lord. Remember, I rescued you from the Egyptians. So stop worshiping idols and worship me alone. That's when we see um, the story of Gideon begin. The first way to overcome fear is to take steps to increase your connection to God, not disconnection. By not letting your internal doubts and fears keep you from taking steps of faith. The Bible is very clear. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, in no way, shape, or form am I a farmer. But after doing some brief research, at this time, a wine press was basically a hole in the ground where you would put grapes and then you would crush those grapes and make it into wine. However, the process of getting wheat is above ground and you would put that wheat on top of a stone or a hard surface and then you would crush it and something called the chaff is blown away by the natural wind something we would know today as the husk, something you can't eat. So in other words, Gideon is trying to supply food for his family, but he's hiding because he's afraid. And he's afraid the Midianites are going to come and steal that food from him. But look what the angel of the Lord says to Gideon as he encounters him. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I'm sure Gideon is saying, what? Who? me? And he's looking around probably to see who the angel is talking to. Is the angel being sarcastic? Because literally Gideon is hiding out and cowering from his enemies and God calls him a mighty warrior. You see, no matter how we see ourselves, God sees our true selves and our true identity. Even when Gideon is complaining, look at Gideon's response to uh, the angel calling him mighty warrior. Verse 13. But if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given it us into the hand of Midian. Can you hear Gideon's tone here? Do you hear the big fat if the Lord is with us, he's afraid and he feels abandoned. Where are you, God? Why are these bad things happening? But God responds with a charge, with a commission to Gideon. 
He says, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? What strength is God talking about? Gideon has no strength. He, he replies with verse 15, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakened, weakest in Man Manasseh and I'm least in my family. It's so obvious the insecurity you hear in Gideon's voice and in his tone. <laughs> it's basically him and God going back and forth. You do it. No, I can't do it. And God's response is, I'm going to be with you. You will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Yet Gideon, in verse 17, he says, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that you are really talking to me. He is like, I believe you, but not really. Again, he's letting his fear talk for him. One th but one thing Gideon does do is he keeps the dialogue open with the Lord. He's expressing his doubts and his fears. He's not covering it up. He, his step of faith is still keeping that dialogue open, but also going to get materials for a sacrifice. He go gets a goat, a fl some flour, some bread, and some broth, and he brings it to the angel. And right before his eyes, he has that encounter with the Lord. The sacrifice is burnt up and Gideon reacts with fear again. Oh no, I've seen the angel of the Lord. I've seen his face and now I'm going to die. And the angel says, no, you're not going to die. You don't have to be afraid. And so Gideon calls that place the Lord of peace, Jehovah Shalom. Why do you think that's Gideon's response? What is the meaning of shalom? The definition of shalom is a peace that expresses the deepest desire and need of the human heart. It represents the greatest measure of contentment and satisfaction in life. Gideon is saying, finally, God, you are my peace. Taking that one step towards connection allowed him to have this encounter with God and that ended in peace. Overcoming fear is staying in connection with God despite your fears and he will calm your storms. Honestly, for me, I felt like Gideon about five years ago, right before I joined the New Mercy staff. I had previously been in ministry all the way up until we moved to New Jersey and I was pregnant with my third child, Eden. I had mostly volunteered to help out with New Mercy by leading Bible studies and prayer ministries, but I had never given a sermon. I gave God every excuse. <laughs> I said, God, I'm not a preacher. And I actually grew up pretty conservatively, and so we didn't hear um, a lot of female preachers growing up. I kept saying to God, God, I'm a teacher, not a preacher. And inside, I secretly really felt like I didn't really have anything profound to say. And so in my mind, I had a picture of what good preaching looked like, and I just didn't match that picture. I had a lot of negative voices in my head, just like Gideon. Um, I struggled with um, negative thoughts like, oh, when if they don't like my preaching or I bomb up there on stage or um, I'm too emotional and I stop cry start crying and things like that. But my step of faith to stay connected with God was just simple obedience. I prayed and I cried and I bargained with God. I had people pray over me and prophesy. Um, and I still went back and forth and I doubted and I didn't want to do it. But at the end of the day, I chose to obey. It was really up to God how he used it and how he empowers the message. Um, of course, it's I need to be faithful in preparing that message. Um, but the result of overcoming my fear was staying connected to the Lord. Second, how can we overcome our fear is we need to sacrifice our idols before the Lord so that he can remove them 
in obedience. The Gideon story goes on. It says that same night after that peace sacrifice, God asked Gideon to take down the idol of Baal and the Asherah pole and sacrifice his own family bull as a sacrifice to the Lord. Don't you think this is strange? Gideon had just finished sacrificing a goat and he has this powerful encounter um, with God. And, but then God immediately comes back and says, I want another sacrifice. Why do you think God did that? Because this time it would actually cost Gideon something. God specifically asks for his own family's second bull, not the first, but the second. He asks that Gideon take down the town's idols, something that's very public and visible. So Gideon being Gideon obeys, but according to verse 27, it says, Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him, but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. And so in the morning when the townspeople find out, they get mad and there's an uproar. They want to kill Gideon. But you know, a beautiful thing happens here. His father actually defends him. Gideon had just sacrificed his family bull, his family's bull. And, and instead of reacting in anger, his father stands up for him and says, if Baal really is God, then let him come down himself and defend his altar. You see, even though Gideon was afraid, he chose to stay in connection with the Lord and obey. And so Joash, his father, recognized that he did this hard thing in getting rid of the idols for the whole town. New Mercy, as a church, put your sacrifice on the altar. What are you loving more than God? That is the first commandment. I feel for many of us during this time of COVID, it's maybe comfort or convenience. Maybe it's literally your family that's becoming the idol. The fear of your family's health is superseding everything else. And of course, be safe. Social distance, wear a mask. But is that fear consuming you? Is that fear putting you in isolation, even away from the Lord? For some of us, our idol could be anger or the feelings of disappointment. You keep getting fixated on things that are not the same. Like Gideon, we're questioning God, where are you? And that becomes our idol because we look to that more than God and we stew in it and we get stuck there. Bring those things to the altar and sacrifice that to the Lord. Choose like Gideon, despite your fear, to bring that sacrifice. Also, new mercy, when you see your brother or sister really making the hard choice, encourage them, support them. It makes a difference, as we see here with Gideon and his family. For me this season, I think my idol has become me time, my time. Like literally at home, I want my time to do the things I want to do. Like, I don't want to do boring things like clean the house or cook or do laundry. My kids are older now, so technically they can do those things on their, on their own. But do they? Uh, most likely not. <laughs> so our poor house is a mess. Wanji's been doing most of the cooking and dishes. Thank you, by the way, honey, um, for showing me love through your acts of service. Um, of course, I would rather read or watch Netflix or my K-dramas or even take or even um, put time into my new hobby, taking care of plants. But I need to make a choice every day to give my time to the Lord so I can make sure it does not become my idol. Lastly, how do we overcome fear? It's by allowing the Lord to provide the weapons 
to fight his battles. This is my favorite part of the Gideon story. Judges 6.33 says, The Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people join forces in order to attack Israel. Chapter 7 verse 12 describes the army of being as thick as locusts, and their camels could not be counted than the sand in the seashore. So it was a terrifying amount of people coming up against Gideon and the Israelites. But here's a turning point of the story. 6 verse 34 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the people to follow him. Here is a guy so afraid that he is doing things uh, secretly at night. All of a sudden, he's leading a charge for the army to gather. But because this is a true story with flawed people, Gideon tests God once again. In verse 36, he says, If you will save Israel by my hand as you promised, he asks for a sign again. He puts out a fleece and asks that the fleece be wet but the ground around it to be dry. And then God does it. Then Gideon asks the next day for the opposite. Let the fleece be dry and the ground around it be wet. And of course God is patient and he does it. God had called him a mighty warrior. He commissioned Gideon to go and save the Israelites. And then he promised, I'm going to be with you, Gideon. But still Gideon needed that confirmation. Everything is prompted out of Gideon's insecurity. He wants to keep checking with God. But if you notice, every time God replies with what Gideon needs to overcome that fear, isn't God so good? He never gets frustrated with him. He never belittles his fears. He never minimizes them. He walks alongside Gideon so that he can take that next step of faith. Because you know, the biggest battle is yet to come. Gideon has managed to assemble 32,000 men to fight the enemy that's as thick as locusts. The fight was already uneven, but God actually makes it worse. He says, I don't want you to think later that you did this by your own strength. So I'm going to pare down the army, Gideon. So he literally tells the people, anyone who's afraid, who's trembling with fear, just go home. And you know, 22,000 men leave, leaving only 10,000. Does that mean only 22,000 men were afraid and 10,000 were not? No, I don't think so. I think it meant that 22,000 men were so afraid that they chose the fear instead of the battle. They didn't take a step towards faith. Instead, they let fear dictate their next step. And it literally took them out of the fight. New Mercy, how many of you guys are doing this today? You're choosing fear. And all that entails, instead of choosing to fight, despite your fear. They chose to leave. They weren't forced to leave. It was a conscious decision. But then next, 10,000 is still too many for God. And so he asked them to drink water. 300 men scooped up the water and lapped it like this. And then the rest, they got down on their knees to get closer to the water and they drank. And so 300 get to stay and the rest go home. Why? Perhaps the commentators say that the 300 that drank water like an alert soldier, because when you scoop up the water like this and drink, you can still look around and know what your environment around you is like. While the ones that got on their knees to drink, they're showing that they're not um, aware of their surroundings around them. They're not drinking like soldiers in the middle of the battle. And so in chapter 7, verse 8, it says, I think it really shows 
how God, how Gideon has grown to trust the Lord because it says Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to go home, but he sent, but he kept the 300. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? He obeyed the Lord. He took that step of faith and he sent them home, even when it did not make any sense. Gideon isn't even asking God for a sign at this point. This is when I really um, would need a sign from God. Don't you think I would be asking God, are you sure? Like, sure, sure. <laughs> like, can you give me a sign? Like, turn the sun blue or something like that. But God is so awesome. Even though Gideon doesn't ask for a sign, he knows his heart. And so God says in chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, Get up and go, get up, go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into the, your hands. And if you are afraid to attack, go down into the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. So what happens next? Gideon goes down. So yes, we know Gideon was still afraid. Gideon goes down with his servant and he overhears two enemy soldiers talking. He's talking about a dream that he has. He says, I saw a huge round loaf of barley and it came tumbling down into the Midian camp and it came so forcefully that it overturned and collapsed the tent. Okay, a dream about bread running over a tent. And the other soldier interprets the dream to mean this can only be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Johash, the Israelite. God, had, God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hand. What? <laughs> Where did this interpretation come from? A rolling loaf of bread means the sword of Gideon. <laughs> but Gideon has the best response. Judges chapter 7 verse 13 says, When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. And I think this is where Gideon truly won the battle. When he bowed down to worship, he chose to believe that the battle was won. And that worship became Gideon's sword. In fact, this army of 300's battle strategy was to basically carry a trumpet in one hand and a jar with a torch in the other. When they blew the trumpet and broke the jar, they held up their torches and the enemy went crazy and they started to run away or attack each other. Gideon and his men weren't even carrying swords. They were only holding a trumpet and a torch. And usually in the Bible, the trumpet, just like the walls of Jericho, indicated worship. And usually fire indicates the Holy Spirit. And so, as you see here, God's strategy for biting, fighting battles, His tools for fighting battles, is worship and the Holy Spirit. So I want to end this sermon today by rereading the quote from the paraplegic man, Ambrose Redmoon. He spent 30 years of his life writing about courage. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than one's fear. So, if you want help overcoming your fear, remember Gideon. First, he overcame his fear by taking steps to increase connection with God. He didn't let his internal doubts and fears keep him from taking steps of faith. Next, he sacrificed his idols before the Lord so that he could move forward in obedience. And lastly, he allowed the Lord to provide the weapons to
to fight the battle, no matter the impossible odds. Pastor David will now lead us in the closing song. God sent His Son They called Him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He lived and died To buy my pardon In empty grave Is there to prove My Savior lives Because He
Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you that you don't dismiss or um, belittle our fears. You know them. You see them. You see us when we're afraid. You know when we're anxious. And so, Lord, I pray, help us to come before you in honesty, but also help us come forward in faith. Let us, as a New Mercy family, let us, as a New Mercy church, be men and women of courage, be men and women who know how to fight with worship and your Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for this time, Lord. We give all these things to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, New Mercy. Hope to see you at our 10-year reunion coming up next week. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.